Greetings and welcome to my channel or welcome back if you have been watching my other videos. Today I'm going to talk about the Japanese Paleolithic period. When I first thought about covering this topic, I assumed it was going to be quick because most history channels on YouTube generally do a brief mention of this period and quickly move to the next and more famous one, the Jomon period. So I thought I wasn't going to find enough information to dedicate a whole video to the subject, but turns out I found a lot more than I expected. So much in fact that I will not be covering all just in one video. So yeah, even if you saw other videos about the Paleolithic era, you might want to stick around because I will cover things in great detail, so I will certainly talk about things you still don't know. On this video specifically, I will talk about the genesis of the Japanese islands, the debate surrounding the date of the arrival of the first people on the archipelago, a really huge oak that shook Japanese archaeology at the start of the 20th century, and some important archaeological discoveries. In my most recent videos, I addressed the topic of Japan's creation according to Shintoism, so if you are interested in knowing how the mythology covers these events, do not forget to check them out. The videos are called the myth of the creation of heaven and earth, and the journey of Izanagi to the underworld. The Paleolithic period, Kyuzeki Jidai in Japanese, also known as Sendoki, which means pre-ceramic era, extends from 35,000 BC, or perhaps even a little earlier, 40,000 BC, to around 14,000 BC or 13,000 BC. It's worth remembering that there are no fixed dates for either the beginning or the end of the Paleolithic period and it will become clear why as I continue this story. A long time ago, when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, Japan didn't exist. The islands that would one day form the archipelago were still part of the Asian continent. Tectonic movement and volcanic activity resulted in the emergence of cracks along the edge of the Asian continent. This depression gradually expanded, resulting in the birth of Japan Sea. This newborn sea continued to expand for some time, but this process eventually came to an end, culminating in what we know today as Japan. Its shape at that time was already recognizable, very similar to that of today. Intense activity, both seismic and volcanic, covered these lands with all kinds of geological incidents, from rias to plains. This activity is still very high today, as you are well aware. Our planet suffers under the influence of various cycles, the lunar cycle, the solar cycle, the seasonal cycle and others. But one that rarely comes to mind is the alternation between glacial and interglacial periods. Each of these cycles lasts so long that only an immortal would be able to experience one in its entirety. During an ice age or glacial period, the temperature of the Earth's surface and atmosphere decreases, and the continental and polar ice sheets, as well as the Alpine glaciers, expand. The glaciers thus steal water from the sea, which exposes more of the Earth's surface. This is important because, as you can see in these images, the Japanese archipelago is located very close to the Asian continent, almost touching it at two points, one to the south, near Korea, and the other to the north, just below Sakhalin. Scientists believe that Japan did indeed make contact with the continent through these two regions during the Ice Ages, via land bridges that became exposed due to the lowering of the sea level. Usually, when people talk about the land bridges that once connected Japan and the mainland, the bridges being referred to are those that occurred during the last glacial maximum, a particularly harsh period of the last ice age, between 31,000 and 60,000 years ago. The sea levels might have dropped by as much as 150 meters compared to today. It is theorized that these bridges were at least partially responsible for the colonization of Japan by humans. And yet, despite their importance, these bridges were not the first to connect the islands with the mainland, because, as we have seen, they are the result of a cyclical phenomenon. It is very possible that there were occasions of connection during the penultimate glacial period, 194,000 years ago to 135,000 years ago, and in the periods before it. This is corroborated by the discovery of fossils of large animals in Japan that are older than the human fossils discovered to date. 
these animals might have migrated to Japan using these bridges. In other words, there might have been multiple occasions when continental species were introduced to the highlands. Examples of species that inhabited Japan during the Paleolithic era include mammoths, Siberian lions, Norman elephants, elk, large moose, giant yap deer, wild cattle, bison, donkeys, horses, bears, wolves, and tigers. The first Norman elephant fossil was found in 1860 in Yokozuka. Since then, fossils of this species have been reported in 300 locations, with Lake Nojiri becoming particularly famous for being the one from which the most fossils have been unearthed. The oldest of the discovered fossils is from around 330,000 years ago. Enough fossil teeth have also been found in the Irume River to restore a complete skeleton of an Akebono elephant. I could give you more examples, but I will stop here because there's still a lot to tell. For at least 200,000 years, these large animals dominated the Japanese territory. Then came Homo sapiens, who might have been one of the main causes of the extinction of a large part of the megafauna. So, you could think that the Homo sapiens destroying the planet is something recent, but turns out that the human being has been causing havoc and chaos ever since the beginning of time. Of course, others point to a sudden change in climate as the reason for the disappearance of large animals. One way or another, victims of the sudden culling of overhunting, it is believed that this creature disappeared from the islands completely around 12,000 years ago. If you have been paying attention so far, you might have wondered at some point if animals crossed land bridges and reached Japan hundreds of thousands of years ago, then why didn't humans do the same? Why are the traces of human occupation so recent compared to some of the animal fossils found? The answer is that it's not enough to have bridges, there has to be someone to cross them. Homo sapiens is currently thought to have appeared in Africa around 200,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand, and quickly began exploring the rest of the planet and trying to settle in other parts of the world. Among the migrations, one that is thought to have taken place around 70,000 years ago was of particular importance, which was called Out of Africa II. Eventually, our ancestors reached present-day Southeast Asia, a region that at the time was known as Sunderland. This occurred around 50,000 years ago. The construction of boats made it possible to obtain food not only on land but also at sea, which led to an increase in the population and its consequent expansion, and this migration reached the most varied places, such as the Australian continent, China and the Japanese archipelago. However, this group that decided to venture east after leaving Africa might not have been the only one to set food on Japanese soil, but we will talk about that later, on another video. The main takeaway from all this is that the reason Homo sapiens didn't cross the eventual land bridges to Japan during the penultimate glacial period is that by then they were still packing up their belongings in Africa and preparing to set off on their journey. And in the glacial period before that, perhaps they didn't even exist at all. So yeah, history isn't so complicated after all. One minute. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, the Homo erectus was in Asia at the time. That does complicate things. All right, thanks for letting me know. Bye. Okay, maybe history is complicated after all. So, turns out traces of hominid habitation have been found in some places in Korea. I will not embarrass myself by trying to pronounce these names, so I will just put them on screen. More than 100 hominid fossils have also been found on Java. This basically puts us in square one again, because if there were bridges and there was someone to cross them, then why no evidence have been found of Homo erectus occupying the Japanese archipelago? Was Homo erectus even in Japan at all? The opinions of the experts differ. 
Some scientists believe that the traces found to date suggest an hominid occupation of Japan before 35,000 BC are enough to prove that it did in fact exist. A second group denies the validity of the current evidence, but still believes that real proof will be found in the future. Finally, a third group claims that not only has no valid evidence of a pre-Paleolithic era yet been found, but also that hominid occupation of the islands before 35,000 BC simply didn't occur. And some don't even carry out excavations in soil layers from earlier times, believing that there are no artifacts to be discovered in those layers. The hypothesis that it is impossible for hominids to have resided in Japan before the late Paleolithic period has important implications, as we need to answer the question of why these early humans didn't cross the bridges to the islands when they were available and were being used by other animals and plants. And just in case, let me remind you that plants also migrate via their pollen that gets stuck in the food of animals or is spread by their feces. Just in case that an image of a plant with legs crossed your mind. But in conclusion, the evidence for pre paleolithic human activity is not accepted by everyone, so we can only speculate on the matter. Perhaps Homo erectus or other Homo inhabited Japan more than 100,000 years ago, or maybe not. Those who believe that Japan's Paleolithic era began long before 40,000 BC often refer to the discoveries made at the archaeological sites of Kanadori and Sunabara. At the Kanadori archaeological site in Iwate Prefecture, a set of stone tools was unearthed from strata believed to be between 80,000 and 90,000 years old. Those who worked on the excavations at Sunabara in Shimani Prefecture claim that the chipped stones they found there date back to 110,000 to 120,000 years, which would make them the oldest stone tools found in the country. However, it is sometimes very difficult, even for experts, to determine whether certain chips in a stone are artificial or natural, and this is one of the main causes of discussion regarding the aforementioned evidence. Another issue that sows discord is determining the exact age of a certain stratum, a complicated process that sometimes results in errors. It's also worth mentioning that something infamous happened in the year 2000, which leads today's researchers to be more cautious about the conclusions they draw from their findings. One day, Fujimura Shinichi found fragments of pottery in his backyard that turned out to belong to the Jomon era. This discovery sparked Fujimura's interest in archaeology, but instead of applying to a university, he decided to study on his own. Fujimura worked in the manufacturing industry, but will spend his vacations looking for Paleolithic artifacts. This enthusiast unearthed large quantities of artifacts from salt layers at the sites of Zazaragi in 1981, Nakamin C in 1983, and Babadan A in 1984, artifacts which were estimated to be around 50,000 years old. After this great success, Fujimura took part in 180 archaeological excavations in northern Japan, and each artifact he found turned out to be older than the previous one. Given the ease with which he made these discoveries, he began to be known as the Hand of God, and became a media star. Fujimura became solely responsible for the widespread belief that mankind had arrived in Japan more than 300,000 years ago, and that taught some archaeologists and geologists raised suspicions and recommended caution, the vast majority simply didn't question Fujimura's work. So in a matter of years, the history books had been re rewritten because of one man. Then the general ecstasy was shattered by reports in the Mainichi Shimbun newspaper, which on November 5, 2000, published photos in which Fujimura could be found digging holes and burying fake artifacts with the intention of discovering them later. 
the Japan Archaeological Association carried out an in-depth investigation and concluded that Fujimura had planted artifacts in 42 archaeological sites and that not a single one of these artifacts was correctly dated. Some showed marks made by metal instruments and others were simply stones. Fujimura was expelled from the Japan Archaeological Association and the Tohoku Paleolithic Institute, and several sites he had worked on were stripped of their government designation as areas of archaeological interest. Finally, at a press conference, Fujimura confessed his crimes. But how could this man maintain such a monumental farce? How did he manage to fool an entire country for so long? These are the questions that make this case so fascinating that we still talk about it today. Let me therefore explain the set of factors that contribute to this unfolding of events. Firstly, it is very difficult to determine the age of lithic objects. As radiocarbon dating is only possible on organic material, one has to resort to dating techniques based on uranium lead and potassium argon which often results in inaccuracies. Allied to this, critical analysis of scientific results is made difficult by the hierarchical environment that dominates Japanese academia. If you gain enough influence, it will be very hard for those below you to point the finger at you. Teachers can also find themselves in trouble if they, when teaching their students, contradict the reference books, even if it's just because they found a mistake on them. Finally, yet again in the scientific field, a lot of credit is given to the person responsible for an archaeological discovery, even if they aren't a professional. In the words of Ken Akamazu, president of the Japanese Archaeological Association, we tend to accept what a person who did the excavation says, and it's hard to criticize them unless you have a strong case. Fumiko Ikawa Smith, an archaeologist at McGill University in Montreal, also explains that enthusiasts have been responsible for many remarkable discoveries in the world of archaeology, so they enjoy a certain reputation. But what helped Fujimura keep everyone blindfolded was mainly social factors. Archaeology is popular in Japan. Japanese bookstores devote entire sections to the National Stone Age, and archaeological discoveries regularly appear on the front pages of newspapers. So Fujimura was not just a celebrity in the scientific circles, but a celebrity in the true sense of the word. He therefore benefited from the protection of the public. It also helped that Fujimura decided to look for artifacts at a historic site near the town of Tsukidate, where numerous important discoveries had already been made. Archaeological site status in Japan is more than just a descriptor is something desirable that attracts a huge tourist industry. Tsukidate had even developed an early man team dream to sell to tourists. In short, the man's hoax is to root because his narrative appealed to society at large. The Japanese are nationalistic and have a great interest in their origins. They also value longevity, with the consequent tendency to praise something older over something younger. And so the idea that Japan's history could have begun more than 300,000 years ago, rather than the 35,000 except today, was exciting, not to mention believable, due to what we have seen before. The false information sold like odd cakes. Fujimura does expose the weaknesses of Japanese archaeology, which over the last two decades has been making great efforts to regain public trust. On a more positive note, I'm now going to talk a little about the evidence that has made it possible to reconstruct the past of Japan and its people. It is thanks to these discoveries that I am here today learning and teaching about the Paleolithic era. Until very recently, it was believed that Japanese history began in the Jomon period. It was Tadahiro Aizawa who discovered the first Paleolithic microlith in Iwajuku in 1946. Two years later, Iwajuku was recognized as Japan's first Paleolithic site. Aizawa was a NATO seller at the time he made his first discovery, but he had been fascinated by the Jomon culture and the relics of that era ever since he was a child. I will link a video in the description where you can learn more about Aizawa and how he became one of the most important figures in archaeology. Archaeologists then extended the depth of their excavations to include strata from before 14,000 BC, something they usually didn't do because they believed they wouldn't find anything in those layers. Remember that this type of research consumes resources, 
so they have to make these kind of decisions. From 1946 to the present day, more than 5,000 Paleolithic sites have been located. Most of the remains found at these sites are stone tools, because the Japanese soil has the characteristic of being very acidic, as it is made of volcanic ash. Over the years, the ash has disintegrated the organic materials it contained, such as human bones, clothing, animal skins and wooden tools. For this reason, in Japan, it is generally difficult to find anything organic from geological strata from before 15,000 BC. It is also believed that, as the sea level has risen by around 150 meters since then, many of the places these early men occupied are flooded nowadays. In 1962, at the archaeological site of Negata, which at the time was a limestone quarry, several human bones were found, which were recognized in 2002 as being between 14,000 and 18,000 years old, depending on the bone in question. They are commonly referred to as Amakita human bones, as they were discovered in the Amakita region, and are the only bones found on Onshu, which is Japan's main island, that are accepted by everyone as belonging to the Paleolithic era. If you look a little further south, however, to the Ryukyu Islands, we come across more discoveries. In Minatogawa, an island between Taiwan and Japan, 18,000-year-old fossilized remains were found, including an almost complete skull. The man to whom the skull belonged to would have been around 1 meter and 55 centimeters tall, with large teeth, a high, wide and compressed nose and a low, narrow forehead. Two missing teeth indicate that this individual took part in a very common tribal ritual, which I will talk about on a later occasion. The oldest remains were also found in the Ryukyu Islands. In 1962, in the Yamashita Daishi cave, the bones of an 8-year-old girl, nicknamed Yamashita Dojin, were unhurted and are estimated to be 32,500 years old. Concluding with more recent discoveries, we also have those made in the ruins of the Sirao Saonetabaru cave on the island of Ichigaki. In 2008, during the construction of the new Ichigaki airport, workers came across several fragments of human bones, the oldest of which was 20,000 years old. The Okinawa Prefectural Archaeological Center then conducted several excavations at the site between 2020 and 2016, which resulted in the bones of at least 19 different people being recovered, and which allowed for the almost complete reconstruction of a 27,000-year-old male skeleton, which was named Skeleton Number 4. I hope you got to learn a little bit more about this subject of when the human life began to sprout in Japan. By now I'm sure you have some idea as to how this primitive man ended up in Japan and where they came from, but I will revisit this subject in the next video. And you'll finally get to know the way the Paleolithic Japanese people lived, what they ate, where they slept, what tools they used, and so on. So don't forget to follow me if you're interested in learning about all this. I hope to see you next time.